if part of our task is to imitate our master and for the word to become flesh and to be lived out in our lives, if that's part of our task as well, then the best way to get that done and the most understandable way to get it done is to be around other people. Um, all of these precepts and everything work really well in theory when we're in Bible study and we're all nodding our heads and saying, man, this is great. But when you get out there and have to use this stuff in the real world that we live in and outside of the pointy building with the great donuts, then that's where, that's where we kind of find out what we're made of. Welcome to the Christian Music Archive podcast, conversations about Christ, community, and music. I'm your host, Dave Maurer. Back in the early 80s, I had the opportunity to work as a weekend DJ at a radio station in Boise, Idaho. One of the artists that we would play was Bob Bennett. His Matters of the Heart record had several cuts in our regular rotation. Flash forward to the end of the 1990s, I went through a pretty tough part of my life, including a divorce that left me wondering where I fit in this world. During that time, I got reacquainted with Bob's music through his album Songs from Bright Avenue, which helped me deal with my feelings of what's next for me. Bob is now a regular part of my music diet, and earlier this year I started watching his Facebook Live events, which have been a trip down memory lane, not just because of his music, but because of the friendships and connections he has with all the folks tuning in. Bob has a delightful sense of humor and is very relatable. My conversation with him was kind of like sitting down with my best friend from high school and realizing that even though we haven't seen each other for years, we could just pick up where we left off. <laughs> I hope you enjoy this conversation with Bob Bennett as much as I did. So you uh, got started in the quote-unquote contemporary Christian music industry well before it was an industry. <laughs> that's exactly, that's actually a great way of putting it. it, it in fact, I don't, it, somebody may have already coined the term by then, but um, but when I sort of got in on the tail end of the Jesus music era, we were still kind of referring to it as that. Um, and then I think somebody put the moniker and it stuck for, you know, CCM, Contemporary Christian Music. But um, yeah, I, I there was not, yeah, there were record companies. And just like throughout all human history, there were egos involved and <laughs> people who were saying, hey, Lord, I, I'd like to be famous in Jesus name. And, you know, I yeah. think all of us had... All of us, to one extent or another, had whether we admit to it or not, had had some of that going on um, in our younger years. But um, but yeah, there was not really a, everything had not moved to Nashville yet. There was still quite a right. contingent of record labels that were happening on the West Coast. Maranatha Sparrow was out here at the time. Light Records was here at the time, and um, so yeah. So, but I, I I'm kind of as as um, I'm kind of on the tail end or, or, you know, not quite the tail end, but on, on the latter part of the baby boom. And I'm sort of on the latter part of the Jesus music era as well. Yeah. But, but what you're primarily writing songs just about your life and stuff. What, what kind of caused you to want to perform those for other people? Well, I mean, I'd always wanted to play and I had played out in public, you know, since I was 10 years old. So by this time I would, had been had been playing out and uh you know for uh 12 years if, if from the time I was a kid and I you know I mean to put a to put a kind of a pithy label on it I I, <laughs> I like everybody I wanted to be Jackson Brown Jr just like all the oh. other guys that were you know yeah singer songwriters and listening to the Beatles and James Taylor and a lot kind of stuff so I was hoping that that might be my path and I'm writing all kinds of songs about unrequited love and all the, all the things that I thought, you know, every, any young, any young man would want to sort of be writing about in that genre. And, um, you know, it never occurred to me in a million years that I would wind up doing what I wound up doing. So, so maybe this is a good time to pull in, uh, your, your, your like we said, we, you're part of the early Jesus movement. Uh, but what, what caused you to write songs, well, let me put it this way. Were your songs in the beginning Jesus relationship songs or were they, you know, songs that you were singing about, like you said, 
the girlfriend that you couldn't have. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I, I, I had a, 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 what I guess we would call a classic conversion experience. Um, just a few days after my 22nd birthday, I had been circling around the new Testament. I was reading what, what then was sort of the gold standard for, for accessible versions of the Bible. And I was reading good news for modern man. Oh as, yeah. As so many of us were. And, um, you know, I grew up Roman Catholic, grateful for that heritage. But like so many kids, when my mom and dad didn't make me go to church, I didn't go to church and, <laughs> right. and rebelled and kind of washed my hands of most of it. I was never an atheist, but I certainly wasn't strongly anything to speak of. Um, but then I started to read the New Testament again. And um, to get a little deep into the weeds on this, my roommate and my lifelong best friend, uh, Dan Rupel, who was a co-founder of a comedy team called Isaac Air Freight, that's right. one of your uh, longer, uh, I'm sorry, long in the tooth is the wrong phrase, classic listeners like me. Um, <laughs> we love Isaac Air Freight. would recognize them. And Dan, Dan and I have been best friends for, you know, like 55 years. And, um, and so we were living together in a house in Downey, California. And he started reading the new Testament and I noticed it. And here's my, my party buddy and my, you know, hellion pal. And all of a sudden yeah. he was talking about God. And, and um, so that kind of caught on. I started reading the new Testament for myself. And I realized even in my, you know, quite immature 22 year old mind, I said, you know, my beef apparently is not with Jesus. It's with just all those crazy religious people that he insists on hanging around with. Ah, yeah. And, um, and, and actually, I, I, I mention that a lot when I talk to people because I think there is a distinction to be drawn. If Very you, true. If, if you make your decisions about Christianity simply based on the imperfect witness of we, the brethren, you're going to have some trouble from time to time. Yeah. And it's not that that's unimportant, but once you start reading the New Testament and realize what Jesus is about— and what he really said and did, I was all of a sudden, I, I, I was on board. It's like, I have to do something about that. I don't know what that yeah. something is, but I've got to do something. So as a 22-year-old, was was Dan already a Christian then reading through this? Or was, was he literally, uh, exploring uh, with you? Literally two or three months, perhaps, before I was. He... Um, I, I actually, it's a great question. I have to, I'd have to ask him how much he would say that his faith, sort of renewal of faith, kind of predates mine. But we were definitely having these long, rambling, completely uninformed God talks deep into the night. And um, both Dan and I, at the time, worked at a Southern California record store out here. Now, this is a very SoCal hipster, you know, okay. kind of deal. Um, back, hippie, not hipster, hippie. Right, back in I got the day, you. We worked at a record store called Licorice Pizza. Because oh. the vinyl record looked like a licorice pizza. I know it's, it's <laughs> I get kind, it. No, it's, that's good. <laughs> it's terribly ridiculous. But the, the point of this rambling is that we both worked at a record store and we started ordering these Jesus music albums into the store, ah. just like we would order a jazz album or a sure. country album or a, a southern rock or whatever. We started ordering in these uh, Jesus music and contemporary Christian music albums. So we were listening to. Um, you know, second chapter of Acts and Phil Keggy and Randy Matthews, Larry Norman, Randy Stonehill, Children of the Day, uh, Karen Lafferty, yeah, um, Parable, you know, uh, Daniel Amos, you know, all these bands that we were ordering in and listening to their music. And we were very influenced by this. We were, first of all, we were knocked out that anyone was speaking our musical language at all. Sure. That was, that was astonishing to us. But also, it, it was part of the part of the wooing. I think that the Spirit of God was sort of doing with us to get us ushered in to uh, to paying closer attention and to having uh, real faith. So, how long into uh, well, you accepted the Lord obviously as your Savior, and then how long after that were you able to say, "Oh, I can mix this with music on my own side of things and write songs that." color about how Jesus is helping in me in well, my life. The the songs came almost immediately, although I didn't go public for, I think, about four to five to six months or whatever. I didn't really do too much singing out uh, during that formative period, but I definitely started writing music right off the bat. Uh -huh. uh, my, my first song was a song called Spiritual Equation, 
which was, you know, here I am, I'm like a brand new Christian. I'm brand, brand new to almost all things Bible. Although I did had a, I, I got to tell you, Dave, I had a really good deja vu experience with a lot of my Catholic catechism and a lot of the things that I was taught as a kid. When I ran across it again, the kind of the bell rang and I went, hey, wait just a second. Uh, I, I, I remember this. Yeah. So to say that I got taught nothing and all that would be a way, way of a big overstatement in terms of my childhood faith and and uh, and my growing up in the Catholic Church. But um, but I started writing almost immediately. And so the song Spiritual Equation is about the Trinity. So, I just, you know, I thought I'd tackle a really easy subject to start <laughs> off with. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't go too, too, too deep theologically right off the bat. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I was, I, I, I wanted to write a song about the Reformation, but I just didn't quite know how to get there. So I, I started out with the Trinity. <laughs> Martin Luther beat you to it, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so how long then, or what was the process after you started writing these songs, um, before you decided, hey, it's something that other people need. And then how long until you started getting, quote unquote, noticed by, you know, a record label? Or did you have well, to pitch that? Or how well, did that work? Well, it was kind of funny because at the time, my roommate Dan and a couple of fellows that he was working with in a comedy team all sort of came to faith around the same time. And that's when they went from being just a sort of a in the clubs, kind of an improv troupe to being Isaac Air Freight. Okay. And, and what I tell people, if you're old enough to remember these references, it'll make it easy. Um, it's basically SNL meets the gospel. It's kind of like yeah. what, what their brand of comedy was like. Yeah. And um, so I was initially, I would travel with them and I was the sound man. They had an old cart machine ah. in the back and they didn't have foot pedals or anything like that yet. So they actually needed a guy to cue the sound effects during the show. Okay. And for the first few gigs that they played, I was that guy. And, um, and then in some of the churches, I wound up playing a song or two before they started. The other thing that happened to us, this was very, very formative for us. Um, if you remember the English duo Malcolm and Alwyn, they were oh, yeah. um, Malcolm and Alwyn in the UK were sort of inventing the wheel over there while right. a bunch of people were busy doing it over here. And their album, uh, Fool's Wisdom and um, Wild Wall and, and some of that early yep. stuff was just hugely. I mean, Larry Norman wrote a song about these guys. That's how influential yeah, they exactly. were at the time. Well, Malcolm moved over to Southern California, went on staff at Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, or as oh, I, I loving that. I lovingly call it, that was Chuck Smith's yep. church. I lovingly call it the mothership. Right. And, and uh, he, was, he was there on staff and they started a musician's fellowship on Sunday afternoons. And all of the okay. people who felt like they had artistic gifts and wanted to sort of do it for the Lord or whatever would attend this Sunday afternoon thing. And Malcolm was really good at hurting the cats because, of course, <laughs> you got a bunch of people in, this, in the room with a lot of zeal, perhaps not a lot of knowledge trying to separate the, out their ego from the servanthood <laughs> of the thing. Right. And, um, and Malcolm was a guy who really took the whole lot of us under his wing and uh, said, you know, there's something much more than just you getting up and singing your songs happening here. And you need to consistently be attendant to that. And um, so that discipling put us in really good stead. And so I started to play my songs at the Musicians Fellowship. Then what happened is I actually played on a Saturday night concert. Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa used to host Saturday night concerts. Okay. Initially, they were held in a big tent while they were building their huge building. And Tom Stipe used to host those. And then eventually there was a guy named Jimmy Kempner who hosted them. And that's the era that I sort of got in on. Gotcha. So on Saturday nights, they would have a room full of like 2,500 rabid Jesus music fans. And they would do concerts. And then there would always be a message at the end and you know, dozens, if not a hundred people or more, a night would raise their hands and come down and there'd be an altar call and people would pray. And that, that was Very the deal. Cool. That was what we yeah. were doing. And so um, I came to the notice of some people that um, at the time, Maranatha Music was an actual church affiliated record label. It was owned right. by the church and run right. by the church. Eventually, Maranatha Praise and Maranatha Man and all that. Yeah. Right. And eventually that was not the case, but at the time it certainly was. And so I came to their notice and eventually they um, offered me, you know, to do an album and, and that I did my first album with Maranatha Music in 1979. Okay. And then you went on to CBS Priority after that, right? Yes. Um, it was amazing because CBS started a gospel, you know, a CCM label called Priority Records. And um, 
I, I think probably uh, if, since you've been around radio, you probably know this. A part of the part of the um, my evidence that I might have a future with this label was I actually <laughs> called and left a message at the home office. They were working out of his home. I left a message at the home office of the of the president of Priority Records. Okay, a guy named Buddy Huey who worked at Word oh, sure. a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And he actually called me back. Oh, wow. Now, yeah, now, a return phone call in the music business just might be evidence that God is working. Yeah, um, exactly. So, <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, so, that, so they eventually took an interest in me and offered me a contract. And I also did a record for them wow. in, uh, in 1982. And, and you quickly uh, became kind of one of the go-tos, as far as I'm concerned, in that era of of music. I mean, what was it? CCM, what labeled that album as one of the top 20 of, of all time? Well, uh, this is a very wonderful thing to recount. And yes, at the time it was voted one of the top 25 albums of all time. Now you and I both know, and I'm not being falsely modest when I say this, right. if this were to be done the, today, I wouldn't even make the top 100 because it's, it, it's funny in terms of Christian music, we kind of have a short memory about these things. You know, country music knows who they're, forebearers are and right and guys who play accordion know who frankie yankovic was and you know what i mean exactly. yeah but um in in the world of christian music unless you were trapped in a car on a family vacation and mommy and dad wouldn't wouldn't stop playing <laughs> you know a honey tree right then, then you have no idea who we are you know you would yeah. have no idea who we are or what we did and and i there's a certain amount of that that's completely understandable you have to remember I'm part of the the boomer generation that built the youth obsession culture brick by brick. Mm. So now that I'm 65 years old and the shoe is literally on the other foot, <laughs> I can't I can't really complain too much that that for most people it appears that my time has passed. I'm a little too stubborn to accept that, uh, but I recognize in the culture at large that right. I'm an old guy and and uh, we're still revering and paying attention to youth like never before so and and I help that along so I can't re- <laughs> I can't, can't really complain too much about it. Well, that's not just Christian music either. I mean, mainstream is that way too. If you're not uh 20 25 years old, you can't get on some of the shows and stuff and you know, it's it's a young man's game as far as the industry quote unquote goes. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. And um you know, again, we, we sort of started this, so it, it shouldn't be a surprise that this is uh, moving ahead full speed. Right. You know, like, there, 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 old dude, you've had your time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I didn't realize is I didn't realize that you and Dan had been friends for so long, because I had read an article somewhere that you guys hosted a radio program together. But, we, uh, so, we did. So he's, he's part of the core part of your community then. Oh my goodness. He's, he's, uh, he's my best friend. I mean, uh, my whole life. I mean, he's known me almost longer than anybody except my immediate family. And, um, and we did do a couple of years in radio. We were hired out here in Southern California to uh, host a morning talk show on a station out here called KBRT. And, um, you know, I had never done radio before. I had been on the receiving end of tons of interviews and I sure. felt like I, I didn't feel bad about getting in front of a mic at all. But um, but to be in radio, you know, radio, as you well know, you know, I can get up and tell the same story, sing the same song, do the same set list. I mean, I can do there are a lot of things I do that are repeatable and it's not a problem. But when you're in radio, you've got to reinvent the wheel every day. I mean, you could have hit a home run out of the park on Wednesday. Yep. But come Thursday, when it's time for your shift, it's time to reinvent the entire thing all over again. Yeah. And um, and we learned some of those lessons, and I was glad for it. We talked to tons and tons of people. I, I've never had so much fun interviewing people and meeting people. We did a lot of phoners and stuff, as we're doing sure. now. Sure. But, um, but we had some great people that we were able to talk to. Well, one of the things I think that lends uh, you to that – I. I've got kind of two questions that are lumped up here, so I'll probably try to split them up. But you started doing these Facebook Live things um, on Facebook, which are just delightful, by the way, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> before COVID hit and before it was kind of the Vogue thing to do. And uh, you kind of beat that punch, too. <laughs> yeah, I was dipping my toe into the pool about every month and a half or so to two months I was definitely doing. I think it, I think it, my first one runs back to the middle of 2017. I'd have to check. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And, and it's the funniest thing, Dave, when, when I decided, I, I absolutely did not decide to start doing them weekly until I did my first COVID one, which happened on my 65th birthday on March 21st oh. of 2020. Okay. 
and I did something. It's I'll, I'll have to make a long story long here. I, I yeah, that's fine. I, I set up to play, and I never really plan how long I'm going to go. I just right. set up and start going. Yeah. Well, what I did is I had so much fun that night that two things happened. I went on for three hours and 45 minutes straight. Oh, wow. No, I no, missed that one. <laughs> and and I did not get up and take a break. Now, I don't want to put give you, I don't want to do a TMI he, <laughs> I thing here for your audience, but I just want to say a couple words that you can free associate. Middle-aged man, no bathroom break. Yes, I three, can imagine. <laughs> three, th- three hours and 45 minutes. So I not only call it the miracle of the three hour and 45 minute concert, <laughs> I call it the miracle of the bladder. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the thing that I, I, I think I caught one probably early April, but the thing that impressed me about you, and this is where it ties into that radio conversation earlier, is you have such a great memory of all of these people that are coming in and recalling friendships and just real. Well, I read an article about you that says you're a real affable guy that has common ground with everyone. And that just is played evident when you do these Facebook things. Well, thank you. I And I kind of, again, I kind of stumbled into that too, Dave, because the first couple of them I just did in front of my Mac and I just went straight into the Facebook interface and stuff. And then I found out about this piece of software that allowed me to put up a little Chiron, you know, little letters yep. on the bottom of the yep. screen and to have the comments floating in a window in front of me as they were rolling by. And all of a sudden it turned into like a visit that I was hosting. Yeah. You know, I was the music, but I have all these people rolling by on the comments and saying hello. And of course, here's the funny part. This is the best part. What would happen is that people would show up and then they would start saying hi to each other. Oh, in other words, like the first night that honey tree came on, everybody said, Honey tree, I love your music. And they were yeah. all talking with each other. And I told people, I, I, I laughed and I said, I said, here's the deal. I said, normally I do not like people talking during my singing. <laughs> but, right. if, but if you're online and you're doing the chat thing on my timeline, go right ahead and visit with each other. I'm all for it. And people do. It's astonishing. <laughs> it's well, really. Well, this just kind of points to that community that you're a part of and that you're uh, now, I would say, fostering this this place for people to come alongside each other and enjoy the the life of the the music that how it's, you know, impacted us and so forth. And but then to connect beyond that, that's just a really cool opportunity. And and. You know, and, and I love, you know, I spend the first, almost the first 10 minutes saying hi to everybody who's coming in right. because I recognize all the people that are clicking in. And, um, and I've had a lot of fun doing, I did one, sh- uh, one episode where I did all covers. Okay. Um, I did a couple of my own songs, but I always do a couple by request or something. And I, sure. I, I told people that what I kind of do is I treat it like a club gig in that if I had a place every Saturday night, Bob is at, you know, cafe prime rib or whatever. Right. And, and you came every week. Then if you showed up every week and requested that I play, come and see, well, I would play, come and see every week. It doesn't matter. Right. I'm there for the people that are kind of there in the room with me. So when there's this cast of characters that is coming every Saturday and uh, requesting songs and stuff, I play them, but I did one night of covers. Um, I had so much fun. I actually did a, a West King song, who, but God, a song that he co-wrote oh, yeah. with Michael Card. Um, I've done, uh, I did a Larry Norman song the other night. Um, I did a Carolyn Aaron song, um, you know, pals of mine. I'm starting to try to work up material by other people so that I can uh, have fun doing their songs as well as my own. It keeps it interesting for me. Right. Right. Well, you know, I think I told you before we started this, one of our, our goals is we really see the value of community. And so as I was thinking about who can I talk to about community, um, you you came to mind immediately, partially because of the relationships you have with people, but partially about the way that you do draw people in and and include them in your community. And so I was wondering if you could, if you had a story or two that you could tell about how community has played a part in your life and why you're spending all this time investing in community and others? Well, I mean, I think, you know, it's funny. I, and I, I'm probably, my, my, if I have any kind of gifting or aptitude for this, it's very, very selective. Anyone who knows me will tell you I'm horrible at answering my email sometimes. Um, I, I've been horrible at answering my mail in one form or another for like 40 years. Um, <laughs> so sometimes I'm, sometimes I drop the ball. And of course, it's always, it's always a danger because sometimes when you don't hear 
then you'll make up a story that says, oh, I bothered him or he's kind of a jerk or, you know, whatever yeah. the case may be. You're fearful that somewhere, you know, someone's muttering my breath under their name. <laughs> or, I mean, I mean, muttering my name under their breath. But what else? What else? <laughs> the other way too. <laughs> yeah. Well, which, however it works. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, it, I think once I was able to sort of figure out that, that people – some people were fortunate enough to give me a place in their lives that I give to the artists that I revere and love. Um, I have a list of musicians and people that I keep up with and I listen to what they do and they're part of the soundtrack of my life. Right. And it's very broad. Some of them are Christian people that I know, um, you know, uh, Fernando Ortega and Bruce Carroll and Steve Bell and the aforementioned Carolyn Aarons and, and yep. people like that. Other people, you know, and these are people you would expect me to say from my era, uh, Paul Simon, Joni Mitchell, James Taylor, uh, the late Dan Fogelberg, you know, people like that. Um, these are people that I have kind of, they're part of the soundtrack of my life and, and listening to their music is in a sense, almost like visiting with, with a friend, you know, right. even, even right. though and it's not a creepy thing, I'm not stalking them or anything. Right. <laughs> um, and so once I realized that there were people who had a wonderful relationship with some of my songs and that these songs were signposts along the way for them, uh -huh. um, aside from the obvious, they like me, they, re you know, the old Sally <laughs> field, they, they really, 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 really like, like me. me. Yeah. Um, and I, I would, I would cop to that in a heartbeat. Um, you know, I, I always tell groups of aspiring artists, especially in church, please don't mistake anything uh, you know, about this. If you get into something that involves you being up in front of people, you're not doing it because you want to be anonymous. Let's right. just, let's just yeah. get that off the table right here and now. And now let's talk about the trick of trying to keep yourself in a good place uh, yeah. when you're in the eye of the public right. and, you know, and what your attitude about that public place ought to be. Should you, should you believe your own press kit? Probably not too much. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. you should right. probably be very, very careful. Um, but so once, you know, once I realized that I was actually kind of providing soundtrack music for people, then it became a real sweet, uh, a real sweet observation to make and help me to establish relationships with people that, um, that I really cherish. Well, it's interesting because, uh, part of, I think what draws people to hear somebody is because they're speaking words that some of us non-musician types feel like we can't put to pen. That's that's exactly right. Um, my 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 different way of restating exactly what you've stated so well is to say that as a songwriter, sometimes I have the uh, honor of giving people words to describe something that they don't know. Uh, uh, give them words to describe things that they already know but don't have the language for. Right. So, in other words, if a song, you know, I'm not. Uh, this is not rocket science. I'm not telling people a bunch of things they probably don't know or couldn't figure out on their own. But I might be able to have a way of stating it that is sticky or makes them feel understood or a little less alone or maybe provides a little insight from time to time. Um, that's if, if that happens as a songwriter, um, it, it is any songwriter, whoever you are, that's a great day at the office. Yeah. But then if you had the have the extra added bonus of of having your life in the faith and hoping that occasionally the spirit of God will use these things. Um, as some type of soundtrack music to get done the work that only he can do. If yeah. you get to be participatory in something like that, who wouldn't want to be a part of that? The, the call of God on all of our lives is to be salt and light to other people and to be able to put it, you know, f for me, for a non-songwriter, to me, that's who listens to music constantly. Uh, that I often have that just that desire to just say, Lord, I'd love to sing this to you. I'd love to be able to shout this out, but you know what? I don't have to because Bob wrote a song already about it that touches me in the same way. So, And, and it's the same thing with me and other artistic endeavors. Oh, sure. I, I, I can't draw a stick man, but if I go look at the, <laughs> if I go look at the work of my friend, Chris Hopkins or uh, other, other, are there visual artists that I know? Right. Um, they help me see things that I that I literally can't see or make my hand do if I try to pick up a pencil. Yeah. Um, and so I, I uh, like uh, like Blanche Dubois and Streetcar Named Desire. I rely upon the kindness of strangers. Yes. And uh, so you know, thank God for these people who uh, speak and contribute into my life, so that they cheer me on in a way, so that when I go to pick up my guitar and write my songs. 
um, I've got inspiration from their side of things. Yeah. Yeah. That's so well, well stated. I appreciate that. Well, you know, I, I'm very aware of the fact that as humans, we have our quote unquote stage face and our uh, personal face, and hopefully they're not too far apart from each other, but I think for the most of us, they probably are different. Uh, but every time I've seen you interviewed or seen any interactions with you, you you sense you have this sense of real joy about you, and and I I think I know where that comes from, but I'm wondering if you can share with our listeners what is it that brings the joy to your life that gives you this fun, loving humor and this this great look at life situations. Well, I mean, first let me say, and this this is perhaps sounds like a standard uh, thing to say, but I mean it. I mean, obviously. Uh, you know, there are lots of sides and, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm my, my, oh, I, my wife has nicknamed me Thomas Eeyore. Oh, really? One half for St. Thomas and half for Eeyore because <laughs> I'm very, I'm very capable of, of going, Oh no. Yeah. They just don't like me right now. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm, I'm capable of, I'm capable of all, you know, I, I mean, the same guy that writes these songs is the guy that sits around in his bathrobe and looks at the clock and it's two o'clock in the afternoon. And I go, I don't know. I yeah. don't know. But I mean, I'm happy. So again, uh, uh, and, and, and he, your audience understands this instinctively. I'm not telling them anything they don't know. Right. But, um, but I think when I'm, when I'm out and about and trying to do my music, I guess my, my attitude is life is tough enough People don't need to be sung at or scolded or um, or otherwise upbraided by me anyway. There are other people who are maybe called to that job and have the right ways to say it so that it becomes an instructive thing rather than a destructive thing. Mm, right. But um, but I sort of feel like my my work is is I hope to to uh to make people feel less alone in their doubts and their sorrows and the troubles and the up and down nature of their faith you know lord i believe help thou my unbelief right um you know and and that they would feel less alone in that and that i could just cheer them on to say look this is this is a struggle worth having okay. um if you are are living life and you're feeling that that temptation like i'm an imposter or this is not for me or i'm not as good as those other christians or i'm not a very good guy or you know one minute i'm one minute i'm i i, I sound like a drunken sailor and the next minute and i'm in church <laughs> reciting the lord's prayer well yeah. welcome i'm not excusing anything but for goodness sakes folks welcome to humanity right this this is how this works out and um, if, if, if Christianity were only for the people that were in their places with sunshiny faces, what a horrible gospel that would be. Amen. Um, Amen. The gospel is for everybody, even, even us messy, you know, the, we, we, we're, fo- we're <laughs> I've got a, a big uh, car that needs a tune up with exhaust pouring out the gas pipe. And I've got a don't follow me. I'm lost bumper sticker on the back <laughs> um, a good deal of the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think part of our, our I call it the social media lifestyle that we're in, is we're all looking and comparing ourselves to other people. And pretty much in public, we share what we want people to see, the successful, the, oh, look at what, you know, uh, look at what I did, look where I went, that kind of a thing. And I think we've lost some of that, let me be real with you, let me tell you what my life is really like and how Jesus has helped me through that. Yeah, there's a there's a tendency to want to protect the franchise uh, sometimes in these in these things. Whenever, whenever you do anything that has any kind of an entertainment component for a living, right? Um, you know, and everybody wants to put their best foot forward. I mean, who who wouldn't? But um, but yeah, it's it's a fine line. Once you if you portray yourself as being genuine to people, and then you go home and you're a completely different person on another planet. <laughs> right, then that's that's perhaps not not so good. But um, so I, I I just I just have always believed that there's no sense in airbrushing out the difficult parts of the Christian faith and of our human experience within it. Um, yes, we're relying upon Jesus to finish the thing that He started. We're relying upon His Holy Spirit to teach us how to become who we could never become on our own, uh, following after Him. Um, you know, and we have to be careful to, 
we, we have to walk a fine line between holding each other accountable and, and telling the truth when we need to, but also not being that kind of person that is just out there sin sniffing and, and holier than right. thou and all the rest of that stuff. Right. That, that's not good for, it's not good for the brethren. It's not good for those on the outside looking in. Right. So, um, you know, but again, and, and I have to say it, and I've said this too many times to people, Dave, I'm glad that everybody is not like me. If we had a world full of Bob Bennett's, it would be a very imbalanced world out there. And that's true with any of us. I'm glad there are people who feel called to, there are those who are called to admonish, those who are called to prophesy, those who are called to give the difficult word. Um, you know, there, there, there are people who, who have the gift of being able to grab you by your lapels and say, hey, brother, come on yeah. now. And um, thank God for those guys. Yes. You know, we, if, if we're all, you know, it's not just one big kumbaya party all the time. <laughs> right. Well, and it's like you said, I think at the top of the show, and I, it might have been in the, you know, one of your Facebook lives that I was watching before it, but if we're following after the people side of Christianity, we're in trouble. We need to follow after the Christ side of Christianity because that's where the reality of it is. But sometimes we need the people part of it to help point the way to Jesus. Well, and and I think that sometimes um, it's possible, you know, this is a real, this is a real sticky issue to talk about. But um, you know, if we let's say that that uh, that if we looked upon preaching the gospel or mission work, and we made a distinction between those who are sort of on the outside looking in of faith, they haven't really put their trust fully in the Lord as we would understand Him or as we would hope that that would happen. That's one set of people. But there's also a lot of people who got in the orbit of church, and for one reason or another, they left. We, right. either, we either pushed them out or they got disgusted and left. Now, if you got disgusted and left because the church was not going to put their stamp of approval on you having an affair with your secretary, well, that's not the church's problem. That's your right. problem. Right. Now, they may have handled it poorly, but it, but yeah. they, they had the right call, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But—, but there are times when people get involved in, in church situations where we, 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 we mess each other around a little bit. We, we were in, and this is why I've always said, at least here lately, that the church is, is, can be a risky environment, but it's worth the risk because when you're in prox, close proximity to other people, you are in range. And so you're in, you're in range for the pat on the back. You're in range for the occasional sucker punch. Yeah. You're in range for the angry word as well as the helpful, encouraging word. You're in range for the people who canonize their own opinions mm -hmm. um, versus those people who really are hearing from the Spirit. But, you know, it, so again, it, 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 it's, it's important for us to not let each other off the hook in, in, in the case of like calling each other to good works and decent behavior. But if you're judging Christianity by the imperfect people who are Christians, you're never going to be a happy camper. It's never going to work out very well for you because humans are just notoriously underwhelming sometimes. In these things. <laughs> that's, I think, should be part of our calling card. We're notoriously underwhelming. <laughs> yeah, I think, that's, I, I think that's going to be the title of my next album. There you go. <laughs> I think uh, I think people would love would love it and be able to identify to it. I would resonate with that. Yeah. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that I have appreciated about uh, as I've explored this thing of of Christ in community as uh, part of this podcast is the understanding that the community isn't something we develop just when things are down, when the chips are down. And you alluded to this earlier. Being part of that body of Christ, it means you're in range to get beat up, but it also, you're in range to get encouraged. And the importance then of, of surrounding yourself in community when things are good, so that when the, the, when the chips are down, you have somebody to go to and you have to say, you know, I'm really having a bad time. That could be your wife, that could be your best friend, it could be somebody from a job, whatever. But the importance of developing that, investing in it now, rather than waiting for it when it, you need it. Well, and, and, you know, with all due respect to those who might feel called to a more monastic or contemplative life. And there may be those who are, who are, oh, sure. who are that, but there's something about being in community that, that, that helps us incarnate our faith into the life that we live. If part of our task is to imitate our master and for the word, you know, the word to become flesh and to be lived out in our lives, if that's part of our task as well, 
then the best way to get that done and the most understandable way to get it done is to be around other people. Um, yeah. All of these precepts and everything work really well in theory when we're in Bible study and we're all nodding our heads and saying, man, this is great. This is, I've got the knowledge, I've got the goods and I, I, I and it's great. But when you get out there and have to use this stuff in the real world that we live yeah. in and outside of the pointy building with the great donuts, <laughs> um, then that's where, that's where we kind of find out what we're made of. Yeah. And, um, you know, there, this is the only time that the Christian faith will be played out under combat circumstances. Eventually, mm. there will come a time when we won't sin. Uh, we won't have to deal with these things. Old things pass away. All things become new. But right now, for whatever reason, this is the, you know, but but I, I the way I think of it, I'm no deep theologian. Uh, I'm, it's not hard to tell. But I believe that I'm involved in something that has kind of a, a parallel path all at the same time. In one sense, I am always, uh, I'm always unable to complete anything on my own. It's done. Mm. Um, the cross is done. The resurrection is done. The propitiation for my sins is done. Yeah. Um, my adoption into the family is done by His grace. Um, and so, in, and those things are are done. They, they don't need to be re litigated. They don't need to be. Uh, renewed. I mean, they can be renewed in terms of our remembrance of them, our appreciation, but we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to get our card punched yep. every Sunday and get resaved, right? Yep. But there's also an aspect to our faith that is never done. We put one foot in front of the other. We learn how to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Right. We learn how to try to wear the garment of salvation that he gives us in, in, in while we're kind of still walking through the mud from time to time. So we have something that involves being finished, but not quite yet. Yeah. And so it's a process as well as a, a, a proclamation of it is finished. So it's, it's both things at once. And, you know, there will come a time when, 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 uh, you know, that won't be the case. It'll, everything right. will be uh, merged and together and we'll all be done. And, and then we'll have an eternity that will, I, I always say, I don't think eternity will be long enough. <laughs> right to, exactly to, uh to uh to plumb the depths of god to learn of him to for us to serve him and serve each other i i i keep wondering if the church goes on being the church um not in the sense of evangelizing or some of the offices and things that we need to do but just in terms of serving each other worshiping together finding out about the lord yeah uh finding out who he is i got a feeling that's going to be um, are, I don't think we're just going to be sitting on clouds with harps. I Hope think, not. I think there's going to be a lot of activity in just getting to know him forever and ever and ever. Yeah. Oh, and I look forward to that. So what, what kind of causes and projects are you working on these days? What's near and dear to Bob's heart? Didn't I hear you're working on a podcast of your own, right? Oh yes, yes, yes. In terms of, in terms of sort of, uh, other activities besides my, Facebook Live and playing my guitar and so forth. Um, I have a buddy of mine in uh, Albuquerque. Her name is Lori Lewis, Lori and Cliff Lewis. They're pals of mine. And she has a background in radio and was in radio for many, many years. And she asked me to sort of be a second chair on a, a new podcast that he, she started called Lori's Table. Okay. And then also she is friends with, it's the most unlikely, but really cool uh, a friend and partner on this podcast. He's a fella named Ray Scott. Now, if any of your listeners are complete NBA fanatics, Ray Scott played for the Detroit, Detroit Pistons and the Baltimore Bullets in the 60s and 70s ah. and was the first African-American NBA coach of the year in the 70s. Oh, cool. So, so coach, we call him coach. Yeah. But coach is like the real deal. I mean, he he's he's got these great stories about how when he lived in New York and stuff, he's like, hanging around with all like all the jazz musicians and oh, wow. movie people and stuff, because it's always greener on somebody else's hill. So all these guys <laughs> gravitate to each other so they can like hang out. And, and uh, so Ray Scott is uh, the second, second chair <laughs> person. Yeah. yeah. And um, we, we co-host with Lori and we just have a whale of a time. It's just, uh, it's just, it's everything but the food and the table. We're doing it uh, yeah. by teleconference, but we've had a great time at it. Oh, fun. Fun. Well, and are you still writing stuff? Is there a chance of another Bob Bennett album coming out? I hope so. Yes, I'm still writing. I don't quite have an album's worth of material yet, although 
my three uh, adult children are on me to re- starting release releasing songs piecemeal like all the kids are doing now. Oh, right. Yeah. And um, I still want to maybe hold out for an album, but I don't know. Um, but I'm maybe about halfway through having the songs for a new album. And I don't know why it, I don't know why it takes me so long. My last full album of material came out eight years ago. I don't know what's right. wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not it's not a place that you have right now that God's got a story. He's building that story for you right now, probably. Well, I, I probably could work harder than I do sometimes. My my dad used to say, I don't, my dad used to say, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Oh. <laughs> and uh, right. so I, I I might have been done now, but sometimes I just, you know. I need to probably put more time into writing when I don't feel like it. And I'll probably get more songs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Bob, I sure appreciate your taking time today and hanging out with us. Uh, if, if our listeners want to get in touch with you, what are ways that they can uh, find out more about you and your music and your Facebook live thing? And Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for asking Dave. I appreciate that. Um, my old fashioned website, whoever thought we'd say that because well, uh, really <laughs> our, our, my old fashioned website is, is uh, bobbennett.com. That's B O B. B E N N E T T dot com. Um, you can find me on Facebook. It's easy to find me there. Um, I also have an Instagram account, which I still don't use as well as I should. And, um, and then you can also find me on Twitter, Bob Bennett tweet. Um, so those are some of the ways to get a hold of me. The Facebook live usually happens on a Saturday, unless there's a reason for it not to. And um, I'm, uh, as we are speaking, I don't know when you're going to play this, but as we're speaking, I'm coming up on my 15th Saturday to have done this. And uh, with a uh, unscheduled break a few weeks ago, um, I've been doing this literally 15 out of 16 of the last weekends. And it's just been my honor to do it. I mean, I'm just excited every week when I sit down in front of the microphone and get ready to see what's going to happen next. And for the, for our listeners who haven't had a chance to do that, I definitely recommend you go do it. It's literally like sitting up, uh, like Bob said, sitting around and chatting and hearing stories. And Bob Bob knows about everybody in the music industry, it feels like. <laughs> uh, he's got stories of people as they walk in and, hey, I haven't heard from you forever. And it's just delightful. So, Bob, I just want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day and uh, making this a possibility. It's uh, it's great getting to catch up and getting to know a little bit more about what's going on in your life. Well, my pleasure, Dave. And thank you so much for asking me to be aboard. I do appreciate it. I love how Bob is so real and down to earth. Getting to spend time with him was a blast from the past, just like catching up with a friend I haven't seen for years. I, I hope you felt the same way. One of the things I deeply believe in is the power of prayer, and many of you are receiving the weekly Christian Music Archive newsletter, where we highlight individuals to pray for. I'd invite you to take a moment right now and lift Bob Bennett before the Lord in prayer. Thank God for how he is using Bob and his music, and pray that God continues to anoint him as he strives to be a Christ follower. Well, that wraps up this edition of the podcast. As always, I'd like to thank you for your support and encouragement for this project. This podcast is made possible through the generosity of our patrons over at patreon.com slash ccmexchange. But it is also fueled by your notes and encouragement. If you have comments or would like to get in touch with me, I invite you to reach out on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. My address on all three platforms is at ccmexchange. Of course, you can always email me through my webpage, that's christianmusicarchive.com slash podcast. And I'd love your help spreading the word about this podcast, too. Tell your friends, rate us on your favorite podcast app, or share this episode with people you think would like to hear Bob Bennett's story. Well, that's all for this week. Until next week, I'd like to remind you that Jesus loves you. In fact, he's crazy about you.